you for coming. I'm David, I'm the interim director here at the Whitman Public Library. Um, I'm certainly glad to have all of you here. And we're certainly very excited to have our guest who um, needs no introduction to many of you. Kathy Tian was your rep from 1997 to 2007. Um, and uh, we're thrilled to have her here talking about her books. And uh, we hope that you enjoy the day. Thank you. Thank, you. Yeah, well Thank you very much, David. And David Aronson, who's the director at the library right now, in between <laughs> times, just got here and then he got stuck with having me come here. So he was wonderful and it's wonderful to be welcomed so nicely back to my hometown. And it's great to be here. And this is the community that I spent all my life until I was 61 in and I um, just love it still. It's still my community. And I'm thrilled to be here and talk about my new book, which is For the People Against the Tide. And it took me 13 years to write this small book. <laughs> I started in 2008 when I retired in 2007 from the State House. And I was writing it because a lot of people don't really know how things work at the State House. And I saw a need to get people more involved and to vote more and to pay attention to what was happening. So I'll tell you more about why it took me 13 years. But, but I did represent the towns of Whitman, Abington, and East Bridgewater. And I did work with libraries, which are so important to us to have these resources, not just for books, but for all kinds of information now through the computers and online and people and programs. And it's one of the wonderful parts of living in a democracy where we don't have our information censored and we have access to both sides of the story and we can hear what's going on and make our best decisions. So I, I was elected in 1996. And then I served for 10 years from 1997 till 2007. And it was an incredible honor to be elected because you're not only are representing the 40,000 people in your district, which now it's up to 42,000, but I had 40,000 constituents be among the three towns, to think that they would trust you to be there and be their voices, making decisions that affect their lives. But also, even to this day, I'm one of 219 women who have ever served in the Massachusetts legislature, and there have been more than 20,000 men. And <laughs> so we need to have more voices in the legislature, in Washington, in everything, because we do have different ways of looking at things, and the more different ways and the more different ideas we have, the better our whole world will be. And they say two heads are better than one. Well, 50 heads are in the legislature, in the House, there are 160 members. So if, at least if we would have 80 who are women and 80 who are men, we'd get much better balance and much better ways of working on things because um, women tem tend to be more collaborative. They look at the whole picture. They want to prevent things. And um, sometimes the men are just there for a short time to move along up the ladder to the next career and position. And not everybody, but from what I watched, there is a, a good deal of that going on. But um, so it was an honor. But then it was a huge responsibility. And the responsibility starts the day that you're sworn in. Then, usually that very day or soon after, you have to vote for the Speaker of the House. And that's an important vote because the Speaker determines where you park your car, what office you have, whether you're in the basement or in your nice big office with nice furniture, or if you're up by the roof, looking out at the roof. And he also, and it's always been a man in Massachusetts, determines what committees you're on. You don't be 
put on committees according to your background and experiences and how well you'll fit as a leader. It's how loyal you are to the speaker. And there are right now 30 different joint committees in the legislature, like there's the Joint Committee on Education, the Joint Committee on Public Health, the Joint Committee on Transportation, Joint Committee on Revenues. So there are 30 of them. So the responsibility that the um, speaker gives you also comes with a reward if you're the chairman. The chairman of a committee makes 15,000 more than what he or she makes as a state rep. In Massachusetts, a state rep right now makes $70,000 a year, gets 16,000 for an expense account, and then if he or she is, is chairing a committee, they make another 15,000. And you're there at the speaker's whim. The speaker can take you off that committee and put you on a committee. Just recently, a friend of mine, Kay Khan, who's been a rep for probably 30 years, and she was a mental health nurse. She has a big background in what's needed these days for all of us. And um, she was chairing before the present speaker came in, the um, Joint Committee on Children and Families, which was really important and she really knew what she was doing. Well, the new speaker put somebody new in who has no background whatsoever and Kay is not a chair of any committee anymore just because the new speaker didn't need Kay. He needed this person more to, for whatever he was going to do for the speaker. Yes, I know. I, unfortunately, the books tell you the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> and um, we need to get in there and experience it. So that's what my book is. So people will start paying attention, get involved. And the reason why I ran was because I liked helping people. And my husband told me that this was a job where you could really help people. And my philosophy of life is life is precious and fragile. You never know from one minute to the next what's going to happen in your life. And I was blessed with a wonderful family who loved me. I was blessed with a wonderful husband, with a nice home, and a wonderful community of people who cared about each other. And I felt so awful that some people, just because they were born someplace else or whatever, they didn't ever have the chance for that. So. So I used to volunteer on Habitat for Humanity, volunteered in the schools, volunteered at church, um, ran for school committee, volunteered um, on the Scholarship Foundation because I wouldn't have gone to college if it weren't for the um, Whitman Hanson. It was Citizen Scholarship, now it's Dollars for Scholars, and we have a, the president of that association. Right? <laughs> yeah, and um, it was. It paid my whole four years at Bridgewater State. So I wanted to give back from what I had received. So that's why I ran. And if you read chapter one, it'll tell you a lot about my background and my husband and how he really got me involved in it. So once I started taking on those responsibilities and then after electing the speaker, Next thing was a budget. And when I was there, the budget was around 20 billion up to 24 billion. Now it's $42 billion a year. And that funds you know, money for public safety, money for schools, money for roads and bridges, money for our public colleges, money for research, I mean, all kinds of things. Money for pensions for um, legislators. And, and presidents of colleges and things. So there's a lot of money going through that budget. And it's a big process. It starts in January with the governor putting his budget out. And then the House of Representatives starts to um, look at their budget, which comes out around the end of March or April. And people want to talk to you about adding things to the budget that have been left out. and. There are lobbyists and there are advocates. The advocates are people who aren't paid as much as lobbyists, 
but they really care about issues like health care or like social work or anti-tobacco, those kinds of issues, safety. Um, so you have lots of people come into your office to talk to you about those things. And you have your constituents who have special things they want you to look at. Duval's Pharmacy used to call me and I'll tell you one of the things that was in the budget that they were calling against. So my very first year, I got interested in oral health. I had had braces and we always had our regular checkups, but a lot of children didn't have that because um, when I was elected, the dentists weren't reimbursed very much. So even though the state provided things, the dentists wouldn't take the low income programs like um, Mass Health for Kids and CHIP. So um, I had a couple of amendments that would increase the reimbursements and make these programs more workable so kids could have dental kits because just by getting your teeth checked and having the fluoride put on them at the dentist that can prevent cavities that cause all kinds of infections and deaths. So I went around to almost all of the 160 reps and 91 of them signed on to my amendment to have these programs pass. So we're ready, we're debating the amendments and my amendment came up. So I was a nervous wreck because it was my first time speaking in front of the legislature and I asked the speaker to be um, recognized to take the floor. And he gaveled the session to be um, in recess. And he called me up to talk to me. And he, he said, oh, this is not a good amendment. You need to talk to the people on ways and means and see why we don't want this to pass. So I talked to them for a while and didn't change my mind. I said, you know, all these people signed on to the amendment. These kids need to be able to get to the dentist. So the um, speaker talked to me again for 10 minutes. Then he called my chairman, who's Representative Harriet Chandler, who's still there now. She's a wonderful woman, wonderful chairperson. And she started talking to me about it. And she said, you know what the speaker has said? He's going to look at this in the near future, and we're going to work on it together. And you're going to work on it, and we're all going to work on it. So you need to pull your amendment. So, so I pulled the amendment. And one of the reasons besides respecting my chairwoman was because if I didn't pull it, the 91 reps who were then in a bind, do they vote with me for this amendment and what their constituents would want? Or do they vote what the speaker wants? And when we vote, there are two um, charts on either side of the rostrum with all of our names and they light up the way you vote. So the speaker votes first. And if the speaker votes green, then he wants all his loyal Democrats or loyal Republicans to vote that way. And um, so people would vote usually with the speaker, and if the speaker votes red on my amendment, then all those people who signed on to it would go on record as signing on to the amendment and then voting against it. So that's spotting. Is there a way for you to find out ahead of time how the speaker feels about it before you go through all of that? Yes, there is a way to um, find out from the speaker why he's against it. We all get almost like um, a 15 to a half an hour with the speaker to go through everything you want, everything that's important. So this means to go through what your district needs for money, what other individuals, other um, organizations that you're working for. So you get that time. It's almost like you know when you go in front of royalty it's because they have this beautiful office and you go into this big room with a fireplace and everything and you get to sit and talk. And you can talk to ways and means at a time too. But um, I hadn't, well, I hadn't really talked to them enough. And plus I was new. 
And so later I did make appointments to do it. And, and the issue finally did pass. It wasn't in the near future, but it did pass. And the speaker was good appointing me to a special commission on oral health where we could research. We traveled all over the state and we had meetings where parents and school nurses and hygienists and dentists could come and talk to us. So, so we did accomplish things. But when you think of the people who were affected, who could have been taken care of, and so many things don't come up for votes that have been filed for years and years. Another one was a bill to license naturopathic doctors who are um, people who use nutrition and exercise and allergies in order to um, cure people's needs and make them healthier and herbs and all kinds of things. And um, so that took 20 years to finally pass. And when you think of how much the um, prescriptions cost and the side effects to prescriptions that might not have needed to be taken and ways that you could prevent cancer and do different things. So, so that was um, my first budget. Then I did get put on the health care committee, which I loved and I wanted that because I wanted people to be healthy. So um, as I was on that committee, you get to hear from your constituents either by they come to your office, which isn't that convenient for them, or they go to your office hours and most reps and I held office hours once a month in the community. And we'd meet either in a coffee shop or in the library or the town hall, and people would come in with what the issues were. One of the constituents I had was Harry Markopoulos, who lives around the corner in Whitman. And um, he was trying to blow the whistle on Bernie Madoff because Bernie was swindling millions of dollars away from investors and especially like nonprofits and all kinds of people. And Bernie had brought the information to the Security and Exchange Commission in Washington several times because his job was a financial analyst. And when he analyzed this, he said the numbers just don't add up. And they just brushed him off in Washington, in that agency that's supposed to be a watchdog over what's happening with our finances. So he didn't give up. He kept working on that. And then he asked me if I could get him an appointment with the Secretary of State in Massachusetts, which I did. And the Secretary, Bill Galvin, did look into it and did try to help him. And so did, um, I believe it was Senator Markey. Yep, Senator Markey helped him. And um, finally, Bernie did get arrested and tried. And, but it caused so many hardships to so many people because good nonprofits that were helping people lost all their investments because they trusted Bernie and they thought he was going to be good. And then um, also at my office hours, nurses would come asking for safe staffing, like to have enough nurses on a shift so that they didn't have to then stay for a double shift if somebody called in. And they knew that it was not only affecting them and their health, but it was affecting their patients because you can only get to so many people so many fast. And you hear so many stories of people falling in nursing homes or hospitals because somebody couldn't answer the bell and get to them in time just to use the bathroom. And so the nurses were coming then. And that was 20 years ago, actually 23 years ago, that they were working on that. And it still hasn't happened. And now with COVID, it's probably worse. It is worse. I mean, we saw during COVID how important it was, and the nurses couldn't get to all the people. And people who didn't have their family there needed the nurses more than ever to be with them as they were going through the hardships that they were going through. Are these non-union nurses? Both. They're, they're both. both. So if they went to the union, the union wouldn't want to work with you? Or does the union no, the union was... No, the union was for it, absolutely for it. Um, there were nurse administrators in hospital who were against it because they work for the hospital and they work for the people who are making the money. And now hospitals 
uh, for profit and they've all merged trying to make more money and instead of hiring new people all these companies that merge lay off people so that the people there are working harder and the people who have invested in the companies are making more money and this has been going on forever and ever so that's why unions are important because we're one voice but if you put all those voices together you have power and representatives and senators pay attention to voters because that's how they're going to keep their jobs and it's not that they're bad people but the system is broken and it's been broken badly for a long time and it's getting worse and worse as we see with what happens i mean we see the inept federal government that can't come together no matter what one says the other one says that you know it's ridiculous and we, instead of really working things out and it's pretty bad in massachusetts too unfortunately so we need to get people who will be courageous enough to go in and vote against leadership and we also need campaign finance reforms so that it's not just the people who have huge watches of money to pay for their campaigns because you need so much money to campaign so um we need people who will push for campaign finance reform we do have a um, public fund in massachusetts for financing statewide positions like for treasurer secretary of state um governor and on your taxes you can check off if you want to donate a dollar every year and, and i donate year after year and year and but the people who win the elections or who have a chance don't go to the public financing much because they know it's not going to be enough and if you do that then you're saying you won't take money from the big corporations and the big lobbyists and things so it's um it needs to change and it will if enough people because there are people there now who want it to change but they're afraid to do anything because then their district won't get what it needs you know not as much as and they can't do as much and they'll probably get beat by somebody who has more money to um run a campaign against them but so those those are the problems but just um to tell you one of the good things which there are many good things but while i was there i worked with people from east bridgewater who came to me in my office one day and they wanted to extend the bay circuit trail that starts in newburyport plum island and it's about 200 miles and it goes through hansen and it goes all the way down to kingston and it's like the second emerald necklace when frederick law olmsted was creating the emerald necklace around boston he knew people in the cities needed fresh air and exercise for their health and so he created all these beautiful parks around boston and um he his company created the Whitman Park, which we're so lucky to have, and it's a great place for people to get exercise and fresh air. And during the pandemic, that was the only way people could meet, was to be outside in the fresh air and enjoy and for kids to get out and have some fun. So- um, I loved going by and seeing just circles of people yeah. in the beach chairs. You know? And when it rained, yep. we were under the <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yep, it was perfect. And, uh, and, uh, and just an, a little aside on that, we received fifty thousand dollars in Whitman from Nestle's because of our having the official state cookie wow. invented in Whitman. So that really got the ball. Yeah, this is the book that I wrote. That I'll tell you why I wrote that one in between this one afterwards but so we do have the park and we do have some other places in town that people don't know about like we have a Whitman Town Forest and some other places so but we you know hopefully we'll start preserving more of Whitman's little bits that we have left because I know um, Peaceful Meadows which is a gorgeous 
place where the cows were and the dairy and ice cream, maybe someday Whitman will put money together to save that for conservation. So the people from East Bridgewater asked me to help on the Bay Circuit Trail because a lot of that trail is the abandoned rail beds that when the older trains stopped, the, you had this wonderful path going from north to south and then you could connect them and then people could walk and, and visit different communities along the way, bicycle, do whatever. Hanson has a big part of it and Hanson has great um, trails that you can walk on. And East Bridgewater was trying to get a section but a man whose property abutted the um, Bay Circuit and the abandoned trails in East Bridgewater didn't want anything to do with it. So we did a lot of fighting. Um, the MBTA, who owned the rail trails, the transportation for the trains, spent a lot of money in court because this person kept suing the state about it because didn't want people to be walking close to his property. But the people in East Bridgewater are working on it again. So, and actually there's going to be a program here in May about the Bay Circuit Trail. And there's another program called the Community Gateways. And that's going to be active around this area trying to get more. I mean, it's for all of our well-being and enjoyment. Is that the one that goes from Abington, past the Rockland Golf Course, through the woods? I don't think no, no, there's I don't. One, there's one there. Yeah. It's over near where the depot is in Abington. Yeah. I, um, I, and it starts there, and it goes all the way down to Themis in Hanover. Oh. Uh, it goes, you, oh. you cross right across oh. the streets. It's yeah. Union Street on, by Dunkin' Donuts, you cross over, and then it continues. That's right wonderful. Yeah, it's a great move. Yeah, there are a lot of unknown places that yeah, we need it's all people to. You know, it's tarred, and mm -hmm. they don't Ooh. plow it. Where is it in Hanson? And yeah. it's Burgess. Burridge. Burridge. Oh, I don't know if that's Bay Circuit, but that's one trail. Burridge Park? Burridge, yes. yes. It's um, down off of Hanson Pete Mm -hmm. Off of 27. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and so hopefully East Bridgewater will join in because that trail goes all the way down to yeah. Kingston to um, Duxbury Bay and it's a beautiful place to walk. So, so we worked on that and, and, and parents would come to me about asthma that their kids had and when we were putting the trains back on they were afraid of the um, particulates in the diesel emissions and stuff from the trains and the state studied and studied but really never did a lot about those things and we have so many children on inhalers now and you wonder like the long-term effects of having that um, in their system so so many things need to still be worked on but the other um, Thing I wanted to tell you that a constituent who's a good friend of mine now is Helen Zack and she lives in Whitman and she volunteered on my committee and she called me one day about a friend of hers whose son, or whose actual nephew, David Stewart, was nine or ten years old and he had cancer and Helen said, do you think you could help the family because the father is a retired construction worker because he and his wife are divorced and he's been caring for David because of David's health issues. And they've had mass health and had really good care, but they've had all the care they can get in Massachusetts. But the doctors at Children's Hospital in Boston said there's a doctor in California who has a new treatment and they wanted to get David out there. But mass health was saying no, we're not going to do that. So um, three reps, Bob Nyman from Hanover, Ruth Provost from Sandwich, and myself all went to the hearing, tried to persuade MassHealth they wouldn't change their um, opinion. So then the three of us went to Terry Murray, who was a very powerful, she became the um, Senate president. We went to her office and she said, let's see what we can do. So she called up Marjorie Claproud, who had been a senator for a long time, and she was a very strong senator and she was a go-getter. So Marjorie called up people 
who were playing in Brookline at the golf um, championship open tournament or whatever it is in Brookline. So she called up people who had a lot of money who were there golfing like the um, champions and she got enough donations to pay for the care and the doctor in California and Ted Kennedy was there and he paid for the travel expenses for David and his father to go out there which was wonderful and so they were, went out there and he had the treatments and he survived a little bit longer but unfortunately the cancer had gotten him but there's a good side to the story and the good side is that the three of us and Terry Murray organized this catastrophic illness in children's plan that's in the state that's still running and one dollar from everybody who pays into workers comp goes into this fund and it would fund like up to maybe 10,000 maybe more for something that the state doesn't pay for and regular insurance doesn't pay for and a family shows a need. So one mother that was present when I went to one of the um, programs where people were talking about how they got help from the catastrophic illness plan. And she had asked for $5,000 for a wheelchair for her son who had been in a wheelchair his entire life. He was now, you know, probably about 12 years old. And the doctor said there are wheelchairs that will automatically help you stand up now you're not sitting all the time, but Mass Health wouldn't pay for it. But this plan would pay for it. And this is what the mother said in her um, program. After a long battle of approximately one and a half years, our son finally has the wheelchair his doctor prescribed. The Massachusetts Division of Medical Assistance denied an expensive wheelchair that we were seeking for Jacob. Thanks to the $4,890 paid by the Catastrophic Illness Fund, we picked up Jacob's chair on Halloween and what a difference it's made in his life. The first week he wanted to help with supper and watch me. He could never see what I was doing because he was always in a seated position. We made cookies together and he could be right beside me making the cookies. But by far the best activity is being able to hug him while he's in a standing position. Thank you so much and please keep us in your prayers and continue this fund. So the difference that each rep can make in people's lives is incredible and that does happen a lot. So there's, there's a lot of positive things going on but there's a lot more that can go on. So we just need to fix that broken system. And in the back of the book, I tell how you can um, get involved. People don't have a lot of time, but even if you can spare a little bit of time to watch what's going on, you can um, tune into the legislature now online if you go to MA for Mass, MassLegislature.com, no, not .com, .gov. And there's a link called My Member that you sign up for, and then you can watch live hearings and sessions or archived ones. So if there's a bill that you're especially interested in, so, so we still have a little bit of time. <laughs> so you can hook into that link and see what's going on and just calling your rep or senator. And I'll take questions in a little while, but I have this by my calendar and it has my local rep and senator from Massachusetts and their phone number. So when you see something on the news or you read about it in the newspaper, give them a call or email them. Actually emailing is the best because then you can write out specifically what you're calling about and they'll read it and they'll have it there in black and white to refer to. And each rep gets at least one aide to um, take care of their needs. And I think I see 
Are you Jennifer? I'm the master. This is Jennifer Lynch, <laughs> Horton, who lives in East Bridgewater, who was my second aide in the state house. <laughs> yeah. And um, the aides, or the reps, call the different agencies, and we can look up things that are getting lost in the piles in the bureaucracy. Say if a person was had passed the test to be licensed as a teacher or as a beautician or whatever, the person was looking for the license and it wasn't coming, then we can call the Bureau of Licensure and ask them to look for that specific one and they will because they're usually overworked and understaffed too. So it takes a long time for things to happen, but don't be afraid to call your reps and senators. They're making a good amount of money and they have one aid anyway, and they have what's called legislative liaisons at every agency that are there to help the reps and senators with information. And they'll explain things and you know really get good information. So um, the entire time that I was there, which was 10 years, I had one aide, and I had Jennifer, I had Edna Donahue from East Bridgewater, and then I had Michael Power from East Bridgewater. It's funny that they all came from East Bridgewater because they were great people in all the towns, but your aide is extremely important because he or she represents you, and we split the work going to meetings because one person can't go to all the meetings. and. Um, so I chose very carefully people that I knew cared about people and um, cared about the state and were going to use good um, sense meeting with people and there would be total confidentiality about people's personal needs and stuff. So I was blessed with three wonderful aides. And, um, but there were other people, other reps, who had several aides. And that was because they voted for the speaker. And um, after you, really, good. Uh, really bad, it, it is bad. Because <laughs> I loved it. I loved helping people. I loved learning about things, being involved. But I did leave of my own choice after 10 years because the more you get involved in things and the more you answer people's calls and be active, the more work you get. And pretty soon it started to pile up on the floor and we couldn't even get to answer all the requests that we had. So I just couldn't keep up with it, but I would have stayed longer. But the sad part is, and some of the um, people who had several aides didn't put that much work into it because you don't have a boss you know, you can come and go when you want. Some people just go in and vote, and they don't really do a lot of um, background studying the issues and things like that. So, so I, I have some more things I can talk about, but if you, first if you have any questions on things, I'm happy to answer. Yep, Mike. So if there's an issue that a constituent is interested in, what kind of an impact does it have when they reach out to contact? If a group of constituents, it, yeah, yeah, that's why the unions, that's why everybody getting involved in that way. Um, and there are like robo emails and things you can send. Those aren't as effective, but it's seeing an individual's note and that person signing it. And um, it does make a difference because they are the people who are going to elect you. Um, so I'm trying to think think of a good example of um, how you could do it. Well, you do get a lot of them. And as the constituent, keep a record of when you contact them, have the number. There's an important bill in front of the Massachusetts legislature right now that is trying to change things for the um, Citizens United Supreme Court decision that happened that allows corporations to give 
undisclosed amounts of money and without them disclosing who the money is coming from. And so when the Supreme Court made that decision, it just increased the money going into campaigns big time. So there's a bill, and I have it written down someplace. <laughs> well, anyway, it's in the Committee on Veterans and National Affairs, and I believe it's 3657, House Bill 3657, and it, there's a special commission that's studying a way to either change the Constitution or do something to reverse that decision. And it's very active in Massachusetts. There are groups like called in, in, Invisible Massachusetts, Act on Mass, For the People, and these groups are working to reverse that and get more public financing of campaigns, which will make a huge difference. Also, as far as like Mike, the big thing that comes to my mind was the um, gay marriage vote that I got a lot of calls. And I got a lot of calls wanting me to vote against allowing gay marriage. And probably in the long run, I got more calls for that. But I didn't vote that way to outlaw gay marriage because it didn't matter to me if I didn't get elected. And because I believe that we're all human beings and that love is love and we're all different. And you see in the animal world, we're all, they're all different too. So, so it, was, um, it was a vote that took a lot of work, it took a lot of research, and I didn't learn that much about it until I was teaching. You know, I, it was just something that never came up in conversations and we never were, you know, really knew because so many people just wouldn't talk about it if they were gay and because of the harassment that people had. So, um, so I learned about it from a science teacher that was a good friend of mine and that changed my whole attitude and a lot of people Life is learning and life is changing, just like plants. And once you stop changing, you die. Well, congratulations <laughs> to you for having an open mind on that. Because yes. a lot of people just do not, they just shut down. I mean, they don't have an open mind about it. So yeah, it, it, was it, that. It, it was, um, I did, but I'm very, it's one of the proudest things that I've done in my whole life because it was, to me, important. And, and now when you see, but, all right, so this is how my book, I started it, I told you, in 2008. Well, in 2000, probably 11, no, 2011, yeah, I brought it to an agent, and I had a lot of chapters written and everything, and she said, it's not much of an interest in memoirs these days, but that chapter you have on the chocolate chip cookie <laughs> would make an interesting <laughs> book. <laughs> and she was right. <laughs> so I wrote this book and I had, I, I had a wonderful um, illustrator who worked for a friend of mine, Debbie Anderson, at the Whitman Hanson Express. And she did her graphic artwork, and she did beautiful illustrations. And the person who started out, who was going to be the illustrator for this book, is my son Bob, who's right <laughs> over there. And he's a great cartoonist, and so is his daughter, Hadley. And I bet her friend, Lexi, who is an artist. So maybe someday they'll be illustrating a book like this. But so, so I did write this, and it's historic fiction. It's 90% true, and I used my aunt as the narrator, and we look a lot alike, my aunt Ian Tanello. All my aunts and uncles have passed since then, but um, she tells what she calls a very delicious story about the Toll House chocolate chip cookie. And I have to tell you something really funny. Yesterday, 
I talked about this book at a Daisy's meeting of the Girl Scouts in South Yarmouth. And the leaders and the mothers had no idea where the Toll House cookie was from or how it was invented. So they were fascinated. And um, five and six year old brownies, watching them and their whole ceremony was just so wonderful and so hopeful because they're teaching them such good values. And the chocolate chip cookie was the culmination of their work on their entrepreneur badge. And guess what the shape of their entrepreneur badge is? The chocolate chip cookie. Oh, yes. So that's, that's so cool. <laughs> for all of Girl Scouts. Not just for them, oh, yes. but all wow. Girl Scouts. All because Ruth Wakefield, who invented it in 1937, was a woman ahead of her time. She was an entrepreneur. And when everybody was saying she was crazy to open the Toll House restaurant back during the Depression, she and her husband moved forward, took all their life savings, and built this old building where, not built it, bought it, that was up where Wendy's is now. And it was, they turned it from what looked like nothing into one of the best restaurants in the country. I have, um, I'm, I'm originally from Hull, and there's an artist out there named Betty Trubia. She does beautiful, beautiful pictures of Hull, Par Paragon Park, oh, different things of Hull. So I was at, a, at her house looking, it was an open house, and there's a the phone house. And I said, why do you have a picture of the toll house? And she said, because my parents got married there. Uh. I bought the picture. because I, So I had that, and I had a couple things from Hull, being from Whitman, being from oh, Hull. I had oh, that's funny. Right, but she, she put it, her um, parents, she painted oh. it, her parents, in this picture. Oh, oh wow. Yeah, it was really cool. It was a, good, uh, a good connector. Yeah, because when there are older people, what I talk about this book, that's what they were there for weddings, or they were there when their parents wanted to teach them manners <laughs> because yeah. they wore their gloves and their yeah. Easter hats yeah. and yeah. shoes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And yeah. Ruth yeah. Wakefield it made it a very elegant place, yeah. different um, place yeah. settings and stuff. Yeah. And she was appointed to the governor's council on um, business, the women's businesses. So she was one, definitely was an entrepreneur. And she's just, within the last maybe 20 years, come to be recognized a lot. She's in a book called 365 Women, no, 365 People Who Have Changed the World. She's in that wow. book with Michelangelo wow. and John Kennedy, <laughs> Abraham oh Lincoln, wow. Galilee. <laughs> yeah, I know, the book was put together oh, and funny. edited in India, that's but I found <laughs> it online. And I mean, oh. you never know when to start doing oh. the research. Yeah. Yeah, so. And the other thing to do with Whitman this week, I gave blood on Tuesday at St. David's Episcopal Church in South Yarmouth, and my nurse was Maureen Venuti from Harvard Street, my neighbor, <laughs> when I lived on Harvard Street. And so it's funny how you always have that connection and it was so nice and, you know, nice to meet her. So I, so I wrote that book and finished it in 2014. It took a long time because a lot longer than what I thought because you have to keep doing different drafts of the pictures and different drafts of what you wrote. So, so I finished that. So I finished this one in 2021. And the reason that I got to work on it during the pandemic, for one thing, it was a good thing to do during the pandemic because you sit and spend a lot of time <laughs> at your computer. But I'm not a TV person, but I was watching more TV and I saw the overt racism in this country that I had never seen before. I mean, I knew there were problems, but I mean, it's huge. It's all over the place and it's in every community. So that was bothering me. Watching the um, Congress 
not be able to come together to do things. Seeing the gap between the working class, which is just disappearing because the profits of the monopolies that our laws have allowed to take over things and control the prices of everything. So both husband and wife have to be working to pay the bills, to own a house, and you see so many people who just can't afford a house. And it's just wrong because each person deserves the life that I had, that you can have time to spend with your family, to enjoy it. So, so that's why I said, I'm going to do it. And somebody introduced me to, I have her name in the acknowledgments if you ever want to write a book. Her name's Marjorie Turner Holman, and she writes books about trails for, um, that are easy trails because she had a stroke when she was young and she can only walk on easy trails. So she has a website and she's written many books, but she and her sister do these history writings. She wrote um, for the Library of Congress and did the interviews of the veterans the same way Jen and I were working on when we were in the legislature and it was to interview especially World War II veterans and then have their memories be recorded in Congress and that's still going on I believe but um, this woman Marjorie I paid to be my coach to make sure that I had deadlines to keep up with to keep writing but she would also read things and say, you know, this needs to be explained a little more, or well, you kind of go overboard in this part. And, and she was really good and really nice and kind, too. You enjoyed working with her. So if anybody wants to write a book, and we all have um, stories, Dan? I just want to say, um, I'm Dan Brillman with e-awakening.com. Uh, I've been working uh, really hard with a guy named Al French. Who is the, one of the people in your book yes. that came to talk about the Bay Circuit Trail? And I've been working on trying to preserve and protect small parcels of land that are falling through the cracks because the big um, mm -hmm. well, land trusts can't deal with the little things. Mm -hmm. um, and when I saw your book, when I found out about that you wrote the book from Al, I was I was mm -hmm. like, I was I, I don't know, try the feeling that I was just so overjoyed. The courage and the caring that you've shown by not just the book itself, but writing the book, I think, has really tremendously uh, made, a, it's going to make a huge difference um, in our world. And I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you've done. Thank you very much. And, um, and my, my reason for, vote, for writing it is because I care, but it's also for my grandchildren because I them and all kids to have a beautiful future and I don't care about making any money on it because I'm surviving fine. I want them to have all the opportunities that we had and to have a great place to grow up in, to live, to have like Al French works on the Bay Circuit Trail, to have those kinds of places to be outside and to enjoy. So, um, so Marjorie is into that too. Yep. If I may, my name sure. is Dawn Byers. I'm a Whitman resident. Uh, I'm also an elected member of the Whitman Hanson School Committee Ooh. for the past three years. And this past June, I also volunteered for the Whitman Cultural Council because mm -hmm. I saw there was a need on that um, volunteer committee as well. Um, but I did want to um, thank you and appreciate how you recognized when um, Harry Markopoulos came to you mm -hmm. and asked for your help. Mm -hmm. and because others were not listening to him, mm -hmm. especially the Securities and Exchange Commission. Mm -hmm. And you recognized when he said to you, something doesn't add up, and you helped him to get mm -hmm. to that next step. So um, you, for bringing that forward, it's absolutely mm -hmm. amazing. Um, I do, I do want to ask you, sure. back in 1996, how did you make the decision um, to run for <laughs> state representative? Well. Um, my husband had been a rep in the 70s, and there was a, he left after two, such, two years, no, two terms, because he didn't like campaigning. He didn't like knocking on doors and walking around asking people for a vote. 
And um, he then became a scout for the New England Patriots because football was his life. And that's why red and black are our Whitman Hanson colors. And <laughs> we still wear red and black for Whitman yep, Hanson. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. So, so um, he said when this seat opened up, you would love it. You know, you've been in, on the school committee. You've been on so many things. People know you in town. People like you. You taught in East Bridgewater. So I had a lot of families who I knew in East Bridgewater. So he said, um, you know, why don't you do it? So this, I was teaching full time at the time. And so I made a list of all the pros and all the cons of what was going to be good. One of the cons were I did not like public speaking. And now here I am here today with two microphones on and I love it. <laughs> because there's a lot to get out to lots of people and hopefully make that difference. So this was, um, I decided on Mother's Day that I would run and then the election was going to be in September of that year. So I ran and I lost by 75 votes, which brings up the point every vote count. 75 votes is not a lot of votes. And some people in my family didn't vote because they thought I had it made because I did really well in the primary. But you can't assume anything. You have to vote. Just the Whitman School Committee and Selectman's race in last spring, yes. the difference was six votes. For two people. Yeah, yes. six votes. When you think of it, six more people voted the difference. It could be, I don't know. And in where I live now in Howitch, our last fall election, the difference was 30 votes. And a woman beat a guy by 30 votes. Thank goodness, because we do need to get more women. And it's not just every guy that we want to be, but we just, you know, she was very well qualified. And so, so we did. And also, when I was in the legislature, the death penalty vote to make it legal to have the death penalty again in Massachusetts lost by one vote. So when you think of if one person hadn't been there and, and he actually changed his mind, first he voted for it and then asked to reconsider the vote and only a person who had voted in what turned out to be can um, ask for reconsideration, and he changed his vote and voted against it. So, so chapter five tells you how I beat the the second the person who beat me. So if, if in yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yep, yep. But um, but it was mostly because I wanted to help people. But I had done so much in the communities too, so I was well known, and. I had the backing of, I had to call people who were activists in the different towns who were working on the school committee, working on the building of a new library in Town Hall in Abington, working on a new addition to the middle school in East Bridgewater. People who you knew would be activists and it takes a lot of work, but you can do it. And what I realized, you know, being a shy, more introverted person, when I ran, and I said, you know, I'll never be able to get up there and speak like those people. One of the most important qualities is to listen, is to hear what the people need and what they're saying because you're representing them. And then we all do have voices and you can make yourself get up and talk even if you're nervous. And after a while you get over that. I think you're passionate about what you're talking about. Yes, then yeah, the definitely. The yeah, it does, yeah. And so we need people to run who will um, take that step. And even if you don't win the first time, you can try the second time. And also, we're working to get more transparency at the State House. There are groups like um, Move On Mass, Mass and Act On Mass, because the committees that we're on, votes come out of those committees, but the votes don't actually show individual votes it comes out as one whole you know that it passed by this many votes and failed by so many so we really need to get those things so, so to volunteer on somebody's campaign who you believe in who you see is doing things and learn what it takes plus to 
it'll increase your network. And that's what a lot of it is, is just increasing the numbers of people you know. And um, by doing that, like being involved in your communities. And I think um, just asking to go to like the mother's club meetings or the women's clubs and gardens clubs, the scholarship foundation, you know, any of those kinds of things and like learning what people in the community care about the community. Yeah. Anybody have other questions or comments? <laughs> well, th there is a lot to it. There's a lot more. Um, I hope that this book will inspire people. I was telling David earlier that at the end of April, I'm doing a virtual library talk that's going to be through the town of Tewksbury's Library and the State House Library. So that will hopefully get the word out to people. Because the more people who start just calling their reps, just having that phone number ready for when you need it. And in my book, I talk about the huge need for more journalists. And the sad situation, I subscribe to the Cape Cod Times, which gets smaller and smaller, the actual newspaper that is online. But the journalists are the people who watch over the government to see what's going on. And there aren't too many people watching over it these days. So we need to um, get more people who want to be journalists. But I watch PBS World News that's on at 6 o'clock Monday through Fridays. And that gives you really a good look at the whole world and national picture more than the local channels, which are the um, channel four and five and seven, which all have good people. But you learn a lot about um, car accidents and sad things that are happening, which we need to know. But we need to know the national and the world things and um, to get involved with those. And there was one thing along with that. Oh, yeah. There is a channel called Fox News, <laughs> which is a for-profit news. So is CNN. They're for-profits. So they're showing you what they want to show you. We have so much disinformation and misinformation going on around that we can't even sit down to say black is black and white is white. <laughs> to say this, this is a fact. So we need to support the public broadcasting, which is PBS. It's Channel 2, which brings us Sesame Street and Daniel Tiger and Mr. Rogers, one of my favorite programs. <laughs> um, so, so those things, too, and those things are mentioned in the book. But Tom and Cora is good, too, at night. What time is he? Um, should, it's, it's, it's a uh, woman. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Christian. Oh, Christian. Oh, Christian. Yeah, um, is that PBS or? Yep, that's oh. PBS. Oh, that's oh, 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 yeah, you can't be that. <laughs> all creatures great and small. I did love that. We all loved it. <laughs> Call the midwife. Oh, wow. Doc Martin. And the original Don Abbey. Don Abbey. Yeah. I know, it's but just having the time the to watch. Stories. I mean, it's just all yeah. yep. wonderful. It's, like, it's a great PBS is, is It, it is. It's wonderful. I know. For I kids know. and adults. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Jen, when she was in my office, got her master's oh, in public health. Awesome. And she did great work in the Department of Public Health on cancer mm -hmm. research. Oh, colorectal cancer. Colorectal. Thank you. Early detection. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> she does. <laughs> I have four children. <laughs> I know. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and when Jen came to my office, she had studied Spanish, so she could read, understand, speak Spanish. And in our office, over on the other side of the petition, there was a wonderful rep, Jarrett Barrios whose family was from Cuba, 
And um, he would often speak in Spanish, maybe when he didn't want us to know what he was <laughs> saying. But yeah, <laughs> you know exactly what, what he was saying. <laughs> <laughs> and she also has a great memory, and she um, could find. But is she writing her book? <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You never say never. <laughs> but but really, everybody has a story. When I was in my memoir class, there were people who had been. A woman was a secretary for one of the generals in World War II. I mean, and then there was a woman whose husband went off to the Vietnam War. And she was writing about what it was like to be a wife left behind. And I mean, so many different stories of girls just growing up in New York. And, and they're all interesting. We all have interesting lives. So if you ever want to write a book, don't hesitate. And plus, you can write them for your grandchildren, right? <laughs> and your grandchildren can write them for you. Yeah, and we have libraries to keep them in, thank goodness. <laughs> and, and just um, when I was writing the cookie book, the Stonehill Martin Institute has an incredible archives and has all the pictures that Stanley Bowman, who oh, was a yeah. photographer for the Enterprise, right. took. And so you can right. see things, right? Yep. So I used those pictures for my artists to copy. Mm -hmm. And um, it's amazing, the libraries, the Lilly Library in Indiana. I, I got information about Ernie Pyle, who was a journalist during World War II who um, was embedded in the troops in the Pacific, and he unfortunately was killed during World War II while he was following the troops. But before that, in 1938, he wrote three syndicated columns about the Toll House. And he had visited, and he talked about how the Wakefields were successful, but they never cheated anybody. They never gave somebody poor quality. They never scrimped. They did everything top notch, and so, so it's a big thing to be proud of in Whitman. So, so thank goodness for libraries, and I really appreciate the Whitman Library having me here. And, and thank you for coming. Well, you're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and if anybody, if you are interested, I have books. This book is fifteen dollars. If you buy it online at Amazon, it's twenty. And the cookie book is ten dollars, and um, it's fifteen online if you're interested. But thank you for being a great audience. Any, but do you have any other questions before we? Start? But thank you for coming, and thanks for being here. <laughs>